Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I think we're going to get started. So today we have Umesh Vazirani here with us. And, oops, I lost my... <laughs> I lost my thing. There we go. So Umesh is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley, and director of the Berkeley Quantum Computation Center. Uh, he's one of the founders of the field of quantum computing, uh, starting with his 1993 paper on, uh, with his student Ethan Bernstein on quantum complexity theory. He has also worked on classical algorithms for online ad auctions, as well as graph separators, for which he was awarded the 2012 Fulkerson Prize with Sanjeev Arora and also Satish Rao. So today we have Umesh, and he's going to speak with us about taming the quantum tiger, which is sure to be an exciting talk. So let's welcome Umesh. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Thanks. So, uh, thanks, Krista. So, I'm, I'm going to start um, um, by stating as naively as possible uh, what I'll talk about, and then you know we'll, um, and then um, then I'll try to outline the the main concepts of. Uh, okay, so so um, no, well, this doesn't work, does it? Okay. Um, um, okay, so um, I'm sure you you all know. Um, you know, the, the thing that uh, quantum computing teaches us is that, um, is that, you know, unlike classical systems where an n particle system requires only n parameters to specify, a quantum system requires two to the n or exponential in n parameters to set, specify. So this is, of course, great if you're doing computation, like quantum computation, but, but there's a flip side to it, which is, uh, it also makes it uh, difficult to analyze and understand and control quantum systems. So, so that's, this is the part that I want to talk about. In fact, this, this was maybe the, the early motivation for quantum computing, at least in Feynman's paper, where the issue was how do you simulate a quantum system, given that there are exponentially many parameters. OK, so, so um, just visually, uh, you know, OK, so, so your state of n qubits is a, is a 2 to the n um, dimensional vector lying in a 2 to the n dimensional complex Hilbert space. Um, and so naively, you want to think about, well, could it be that, um, that natural quantum states, whatever that means, uh, sit in a small corner of this Hilbert space? So that, um, so that actually you could maybe have a hope of understanding them, computing with them, working with them in some, in some way. OK, and then uh, there's a second part about quantum mechanics that's, that's very problematic when you come to uh, working with quantum systems, which is, um, which is this whole idea of measurement that, uh, in fact, what you can access through measurement is not this entire quantum state, but only a small part of it. So when you, when you measure, you don't see the superposition. You only see x with probability alpha x magnitude squared. And we also know from Holevo's theorem that we can obtain at most n bits of information through a measurement, no matter how we structure the measurement. And so, um, OK, so there's a, there's a second question that, that, uh, that's brought up by, by these limitations, which is, how would you actually test a quantum system, um, given that it's exponentially powerful and that you have this kind of limited access to it? And so, um, so let me try to formulate what that what that question might mean. So, um, so here's a here's a particularly um, extreme version of the problem. So, so let's say that we, we think of our quantum system as being a being an untrusted device, and and then we model the fact that we have limited I/O by by actually making the the input output be binary because we may as well. And so let's imagine that we have two buttons on this box for zero and label zero and one, and two light bulbs labeled zero and one. And so this is the only way we get to interact with the, with the box. And so our challenge is, 
you know, what we want to do is we want to verify that this, that this device really represents the quantum system of our choice, meaning it, it has the required dynamics, it starts in the required uh, you know, specified initial state, and then you can, actually, uh, you can actually command it to go through a certain kind of dynamics, and it does faithfully execute those. So, so, so if you think about it for a couple of minutes, it, it should be clear that this, this should be impossible. Right? Because, for, for example, um, you know, if, if you don't have complexity considerations, then, then you know, this box could be doing a classical simulation of a quantum device and, and then report the answer pretending to be doing the quantum evolution. And what we care about here is that it should really be, you know, the dynamics should be exactly what we specify them to be. So, um, so it turns out that, uh, that there's a slightly different setting where, in fact, you can do this. And this slightly different setting is one where you have two such boxes, and they share entanglement, but they are not allowed to communicate with each other. And so in this setting, in fact, you can, you know, there, there's, a, there's a form in which you can, you can achieve this goal of, of even though the, the, the devices are completely untrusted, but, uh, you know, so they are supposed to behave in a certain way, and you, you, don't, you don't trust it, so you, all you can do is you can test whether they do through this, this small interface. And, and the theorem says you can. Okay, so le let me just say, uh, you know, where this, this comes up. Let me give you a couple of examples. So, so, so the first uh, example is in quantum cryptography, where, um, you know, of course, uh, BB84, um, you know, going back to 1984, there, there was this protocol for, uh, well, that proposed that you could use, you could get unconditional security uh, for key distribution. Uh, using the principles of quantum mechanics. And then the actual proof that it achieves unconditional security uh, did not come until about 15 years later by Myers and Shore Cresco. But then, uh, you know, despite this proof of unconditional security, there were, um, you know, the, the actual physical implementations that people have come up with have, have all been, been attacked. And, um, and in particular, there are these uh, there are these attacks called side channel attacks, um, you know, of which there was there was already a, you know a hint of it in, in the earliest implementation of uh, of um, of uh, um, you know of quantum key distribution. So this was one where it was uh, it, it was John Smolin and Charlie Bennett. Um, who worked on a on a tabletop device, which uh, you know, where Alice and Bob were about uh, three feet apart, and and uh, and it was unconditionally secure, except for the fact that um, you know, when when you were sending a one, it it uh, it put a heavier load on the on the power supply, and so you could actually hear the difference. <laughs> okay, so so now. Um, um, so, so um, Myers and Yao, uh, in you know about 15 years ago, put forth this challenge of DIQKD, device-independent quantum key distribution, where where they asked, you know, is it possible to achieve this kind of security with devices which you don't even trust? So, so in other words, you know, leave aside these side-channel attacks and particular attacks, but let's say that, you know, you, you just don't trust. The, the implementers of these boxes to do anything right, and you, you just want to make sure in your protocol that, that, that it is really secure. So at that point, you could really call it unconditional security. So that, that's, that's one place where this, this could be useful. I guess another, oh, uh, um, another application is, of course, uh, you know, if you have, um, you know, if you're, if you're building a quantum computer and, you know, Maybe you're not really sure what, what you've actually achieved, and how do you actually test it? So, so again, it's supposed to do something that you cannot do. So how do you test this kind of device? And, and, uh, um, OK, so, so, so let, me, um, let me jump back to the first theme, and, and then I'll come back to this, uh, this in a little bit. OK, so, um, so the, the first theme was, you know, are there quantum states which we can uh, which we can work with efficiently, and and so um, 
you know, an interesting class of states is, is uh, ground states of local Hamiltonians. Uh, you know, these, these are states which could be highly coherent at low temperature. And so you could, you could sort of ask, um, you know, if you describe a Hamiltonian, a local Hamiltonian, where, you know, it's a sum of local terms, each of which is easy to describe because it's, it's local, uh, you could ask, well, can you, can you necessarily describe the ground state um, using only polynomial amount of information? And of course, the, the trivial answer is yes, you can. I mean, if the ground state is unique, then you can describe it by just saying, describing the Hamiltonian and, and then saying, um, what I mean is the unique ground state of this Hamiltonian. So that's a perfectly good description. But of course, what, what we want is, what, is uh, not only that we can specify the state, but we can also compute interesting properties of it. So for example, we want to compute uh, the ground energy or two-point correlations or other such things. And uh, I guess, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, a, there's this very interesting emerging field, uh, uh, quantum Hamiltonian complexity, which, which studies this, this, these questions, which are the intersection of condensed matter physics and uh, quantum complexity theory. So, um, so what do we know about it? So, um, so what we know goes back to Kitaev, uh, I guess, already uh, at least 15 years ago, where he proved that, that even approximating the ground energy of a local Hamiltonian is NP, uh, QMA hard. So QMA hard is the quantum analog of NP hard. And uh, what we conjecture is that, uh, you know, that, that there, there's n not even a sub-exponential size classical witness for QMA complete problems. So meaning that, that if you wanted to if you wanted to approximate the ground energy of this local Hamiltonian, then there's not even, you know, even if you appeal to some, some infinitely powerful prover who, you know, they could not write down a sub-exponential sub size proof that you could check. Okay. So, so it's, it's sort of, it's, it's a, in a very strong way saying that the exponential complexity is inherent to this problem. And then, um, you could sort of say, well, what about, what about uh, special cases of this? And, um, um, you know, so this result has been improved to the point where, um, I, I guess, um, uh, Gottesman and Irani showed that it's hard under some assumptions, even for translation invariant 1D Hamiltonians, meaning you have nearest neighbor interactions on the line and, and, uh, and the terms of the Hamiltonian are exactly the same, just just translate it. Okay, so, so this seems to suggest that, um, you know, ground states of local Hamiltonians are just hard, you know, even in the simplest cases. Um, um, but then, on the other hand, um, um, if you look at what people do in practice, so um, about 20 years ago, Steve White came up with this heuristic called DMRG, which, which works which is extremely successful in practice uh, for, for 1D systems, at least. And so you could ask is, you know, uh, so it works in practice, but does it work in theory? And uh, well, the, the answer with DMRG is that it, it can get stuck in local optima. But still, you, you, you'd want to know is there, you know, is it, could it be that, uh, you know, how could it be that, that, that uh, you have so much success in practice and and theoretically, the problem is completely hard. So, you know, surely there's some principal phenomenon where, where there's some special case suitably formulated where you can solve the problem in polynomial time. And this is why the heuristic might work. Um, you know, going beyond 1D, there's, um, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a real challenge. And, and there's this beautiful work by, uh, uh, well, by Vestrate Chirac and, and Vidal um, giving, you know, um, methods of representing quantum states of 2D systems uh, efficiently using tensor networks, where you can where you can manipulate them efficiently, and and uh, um, you know, so so uh, so how successful this would be going forward is, uh, 
you know, it's, it's not clear, but, but it's, it's really a, um, uh, you know, it, it seems like an extremely promising direction for, for a very important area. So, um, okay, so, so coming back to this 1D question, so how can we formulate a, an interesting subclass of 1D systems which might be tractable? So it turns out that, that the interesting parameter here is the spectral gap. So it's the, it's the difference between the ground energy and the energy of the first excited state. Um, and uh, if you look closely at these QMA completeness uh, problems, then they, then they have a spectral gap which, which scales as one over polynomial in N, the number of particles. So, so the scaling is, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, there's this natural subclass, which is the gap local Hamiltonians, which is um, uh, where the spectral gap is a constant. So here the, the scaling is important. So we have to, we, you know, we scale so that each of the terms of the Hamiltonian has constant norm, say norm one. So, so when we say there's a constant gap, it's sort of saying, so Im imagine that the ground energy was zero, then, then the first excited state has energy which is, which is a constant, which means that it violates a constant, at least a constant fraction of, of, one, one, of these, uh, one of these terms, right? So, uh, or if you want to think about the classical analog, then the classical analog is satisfiability, where, where if, if the formula is, is uniquely satisfiable, so, so the ground energy is zero, and then the first excited state, well, you know, you, you, if, if you don't satisfy all the, all the clauses, then you must violate at least one. So the gap would be at least one. So, so there was this beautiful theorem that Matt showed um, about five years ago, uh, showing that ground states of 1D Hamiltonians have, have, uh, have a polynomial um, matrix product state representation. And since you can use this representation, once you have the representation, you can compute energy, you know, two-point correlations, everything efficiently. So, so the problem is in NP. Right? For, so for gapped 1D Hamiltonians, it's not really, uh, you know, it's no longer QMA hard, it's, it's, it's actually in NP. So, um, so then you could, you could ask, well, how hard is it to actually compute this, this MPS uh, representation? And there's some sort of folklore that it might be intractable. Uh, in fact, there was this paper by Shuk, Sirak, and Vestrate which showed that a closely related problem is actually NP hard, um, which seemed to bolster this notion that maybe, maybe actually computing these matrix product states might be hard. So um, I guess uh, last year, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we were working on improving the, the bounds in Matt's result. And, and based on that, we actually uh, discovered that that you could come up with a sub-exponential time algorithm for the, for the problem. And then once it's sub-exponential time, you know, it's unlikely to be NP-hard. And so, so it raises the question, well, surely there might, there's a polynomial time algorithm. And, and so very recently, we came up with a, an actual polynomial time algorithm to find these, these ground states with uh, Zeff Landau and Thomas Wittig. So, so let me... Um, you know, uh, try to outline some of these, some of the main ideas here um, in the next 10, 15 minutes. And um, okay, so, so of course, um, um, you know, the main obstacle to, to describing quantum states succinctly is, is entanglement. Um, so, um, you know, if you have a bipartite quantum state, then we can always write the Schmidt decomposition of that state. And uh, so, so we have two measures of entanglement here. One is just the Schmidt rank, which is the number of non-zero terms in the Schmidt decomposition. Uh, this is sort of a, this is, you know, this is a crude measure of, of uh, entanglement. And then there's, uh, there's a nicer measure, which is, of course, a von Neumann entropy, which is, which is a classical entropy of these, of the, of the CI squareds. So the CI squareds are, are like a probability distribution and you just look at the entropy. So um, 
you know, so the von Neumann entropy disregards more or less the very tiny coefficients. And, and so in that sense, it's a, it's a better measure of, uh, of, um, uh, of entanglement. So, um, so the, the key um, property of entanglement with ground states is, is, this, is captured in this uh, uh, conjecture called the area law, which, uh, which says that for gapped local Hamiltonians, uh, so if you look at the ground state of this, of, um, you know, of, uh, of some Hamiltonian, which is nearest neighbor on this lattice. And now you take the ground state and you, you sort of uh, consider it as a bipartite system. So you decompose the particles into this region and the outside. And you ask how much entanglement is there between the inside and the outside. So naively, you would, you would think the entanglement would be bounded by the, by the volume of the region, so the number of particles. But the area law says that that it's proportional to the, to the surface area, the number of bonds you have to cut the, um, in, order to, in order to separate the inside from the outside. Um, morally, what the area law says is that most of the entanglement sits near the boundary. And if this were true, then you know, this would suggest that maybe you have a succinct description where to describe this quantum state, you describe the inside and the outside separately. But then you also, so, so what you have to do is you, you describe the entanglement at the boundary, and then you can sort of decompose into the inside and the outside. And that's, <coughs> that's exactly what the tensor network would allow you to do. So, OK, so I, I guess the, this whole notion of an area law, I, my understanding is that you know, in, in some kind of folklore sense, it has been known for a very long time. Uh, although it was it was actually formalized in terms of entanglement entropy only about ten years ago. Um, so um, so you know as I said the area law is a conjecture and and what uh, what Matt did five years ago is he actually made this conjecture rigorous for one D systems and this was really a a beautiful you know really a remarkable. Um, uh, paper. So l let me just say what, what an area law in 1D says. It, it actually, uh, so you have a 1D chain of particles, and what an area law would say is that if you cut that chain somewhere, then the entanglement entropy between the left and the right is proportional to the surface area, which in this case is 1. So the entanglement entropy should be a constant. Um, it seems like a very simple statement, but it's extremely hard to prove. And uh, so what, what, what Matt showed in particular is that the entanglement entropy scales as exponential in log d over epsilon, where d is the dimension of each particle, and epsilon is the spectral gap. Um, so the, it's constant because n doesn't appear anywhere here. And once you have this, you actually, you know, it implies that 1D ground states, you know, this, this problem is in NP. What's the argument of the log there? I'm sorry? What is the argument of the log? Oh, it's the, uh, you know, so... D over epsilon. Uh, sorry, it's log of D divided by epsilon. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, I, I guess, um, you know, um, Matt's argument used heavy-duty tools that we didn't quite, uh, um, you know, e even after sort of uh, working through them, we didn't quite understand them. So we, um, you know, with, uh, with Dorit and Ita and Zef, we, we sort of started working on trying to get a combinatorial understanding of this. And, and so, you know, th through a sequence of papers, we last year we finally managed to show that through combinatorial arguments, that, that you could actually improve this, um, this bound from exponential to, to polynomial in log d over epsilon, so log cube d over epsilon. But in the process, there was this uh, side effect that um, we actually realized that you could get a sub-exponential time algorithm for finding these ground states, finding a matrix product state representation. Um, now, there's, there's one other, there's, there's a certain sense in which, um, in which this bound is, is, uh, is optimal. 
So it's optimal in the following sense. So if you want to try to prove an area law for 2D systems, well, then it turns out that there's no subvolume uh, law known, um, known yet. So this bound is optimal in the sense that it's the hardest you can work without proving anything non-trivial for 2D systems. So in fact, if you, uh, you, know, if you could actually improve this uh, even a little bit to 3 minus uh, delta, you would, you, would, uh, you would get a subvolume law for 2D systems. And if you could uh, whittle it down to all the way to log squared, then, then you would actually prove, a, prove the 2D area law. Um, uh, if you, if you, if, if um, you know, if you could improve this to log d, then in fact it would prove the area law for all, you know, in any number of dimensions, because you just sort of fuse all the boundary into one big particle and you know just just peel off uh, layers one at a time. Okay, so um, so let me say uh, you know just one thing about um, about you know, uh, the, the, the main sort of tool that goes into, into approving this bound. And then I'll say a little bit about the actual algorithm for finding, finding the ground state. So, um, so the, uh, you know, the, the, the proof of, um, uh, you know, our proof of the area law actually relies on this object we call the AGSP, an approximate ground state projector. So, so an AGSP is an operator that, that uh, when you apply it to a state, it, it leaves the ground state alone, and it takes the, anything orthogonal to the ground state, and it shrinks it. So that if you have a general state, it sort of gets projected closer and closer to the ground state as you apply the, this operator. So, so this operator itself, uh, um, we want two properties of it, you know, so one is, of course, it shrinks the orthogonal space by, by a factor of delta. But then the other thing we want is that it doesn't increase the entanglement rank across this boundary by very much. So we have to construct this, this operator carefully so that, so that it has a good trade-off between, between d and delta, right? So if we can make sure that, that the shrinking happens faster then the entanglement rank is, 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 is accumulating, then in fact we can prove an area law. And, and the way that this, this operator K is constructed is by taking the Hamiltonian and coming up with a low rank approximation to it. Right? So, so its rank is initially as high as the number of particles and we sort of whittle it down and get a lower, lower rank approximation. And then um, and then the operator K is, is a low-degree polynomial in that new operator, in that, in that modified Hamiltonian. And um, OK, so, so, so the degree of that polynomial somehow corresponds to the increase in entanglement rank. And, and the fact that it's an approximation to the Hamiltonian makes sure that it's cutting down the, the orthogonal space. Um, let me just say a little bit in these terms about, um, you know, about this this whole idea about the the algorithm for finding finding uh, uh, finding the ground state. So um, so so here's you know if if you want to think about it you know where, where did the NP hardness result about finding finding a, a matrix product state representation of of the of the ground state come from? So so you start with a gapped one D Hamiltonian, and now one way to think about it is this gap condition. You know, how, how do you make use of it? It's, it's really hard to you know, understand how it relates to the ground state. And um, you know, one way you can say is, well, Matt did all the heavy lifting, and he showed that there's a succinct description of the ground state. And now we have nothing else to squeeze out of the fact that there's a, there's a, there's a gap. So let's throw that away. And let's now start with the assumption that we have, a, we have a succinct matrix product state representation, and now can we find it efficiently? That's what they showed was NP hard. OK, so, so the way you get further is you have to take the gap condition and you have to squeeze it out further. And, and the, the way you do that is you say, well, the, the, a gapped Hamiltonian implies that there's an AGSP. And now we have got to use this AGSP further in order to actually find this succinct description. So that's what we do. 
OK, so, so let me describe to you how, at a high level, how this algorithm works. So, so remember, we are trying to find, find, a, find a, this, the ground state of this local Hamiltonian, H. Now, one way we could find the ground state is we could just write a semi-definite program. So the semi-definite program would just say something like this, minimize uh, trace h rho, so rho is uh, ground state, subject to, well, rho is positive, trace 1. Okay. But now if you look at it, this is, this is a, a semi-definite program over an exponential dimensional space, and so exponential time. So what, what can we do instead? Well, suppose that I could give you a small, a polynomial dimensional subspace, which is, which is guaranteed to contain a good approximation to the ground state. And moreover, I, I tell you, you know, this polynomial dimensional subspace is well specified in the sense that I give you a basis for it, and I, I, sh I show you how to represent the basis vectors efficiently, so you can do linear algebra on them. Well, then then you could, you could just say, well, this, this particular STP is, doesn't sit in an exponential dimensional space. It only sits in this polynomial dimensional space. So let's solve that. And there, there you have it. You have your, your, um, uh, your ground state. OK, so, so. Isn't there an additional constraint about the, uh, about the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the quantity of the approximation has to be good enough? That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, so. Slide. So yeah. the additional constraint on the SDP, I guess. Uh, th that's right. So, so or, or on this, or on this envelope. Right. Right. So, so we are going to make sure that that um, that this this space is such. And you use the gap to some extent, and you have to make sure you're making enough progress. To that's right. Five. That's right. Yeah. So, so now, how do we actually design this this algorithm? So, so here's the here's the first step. So let's let's go back and look at the classical case. So. So in the classical analog, you have a 1D, one-dimensional satisfiability or one-dimensional constraint satisfaction problem. And now, what makes that easy is that, is that you can do this decomposition at the boundary. Right? So you can, you can sort of uh, say, let me assume that the value for this particular variable is 3. Right? And now, because, the, because all the constraints are nearest neighbor, I can I can now decompose the problem into two parts, the left problem and the right problem. And they can be solved separately. Right? So if, if, if there were d subproblems, if, if each variable took on d values, then this would just give, give rise to d subproblems. And in particular, what you, could, what you could do is you could now solve this problem using dynamic programming, working your way from the left to the right, you know, each time adding one more, one more particle. And, uh, the, the key point is that you need to only keep the optimal left solution for each of the d values at the boundary. So, so for each, each, you know, if you want to extend this left uh, solution by one, you, you look at every possible value at the next boundary position and compute the optimal value. So now we want to do something similar in the quantum case. So, so how do we do it? So the first thing we need to do is figure out what's the analog of, of um, you know, of assuming some value for the boundary, right? So, of course, now it's not just the state of this boundary particle because um, there may be a lot of entanglement between the left and the right. So the natural analog is what's, what's called the boundary contraction. It's roughly the density matrix that, that describes the state of this particle and the bond between the left and the right, right? And so... So, so what's the dimension of this, this object? Well, it depends upon the bond dimension, right? It's, it's, the, it's the bond dimension of the matrix product state that describes, you know, which is a good approximation to your, to your ground, ground state. So for, furthermore, since, since, we, uh, you know, since this boundary contraction is now a continuous object, we need to discretize it. And so we'll, we'll actually discretize it via, via an epsilon net. OK, so, so now. The cardinality of this epsilon net is going to be exponential in the bond dimension. And so, you know, in order to get, get a good approximation to the ground state, a 1 over n, 1 over poly n approximation to the ground state, you, 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 would, you, would, need, uh, you would need the polynomial bond, bond dimension. Or even to get a, 
get a constant approximation to the ground state, as far as we know, you would need a, a linear bond dimension at least. Um, and so this gives rise to exponential in that. So, so the epsilon net is exponential in that. And so the number of subproblems becomes 2 to the order n. OK, so the way we got the, the sub-exponential algorithm is we realized that, in fact, you don't need a linear bond dimension. You can get by with, with, with something smaller. You can get back with something like 2 to the log to the 2 thirds of n. And so, so exponential in that turns out to be sub-exponential. And so that, that's how you get the improved algorithm. But now we want, to, we want to actually get a polynomial time algorithm. So we can't afford to, to do all this. So, so what's the next idea? Um, so the next idea is, well, we can achieve constant error using a bond dimension here of only a constant. So in other words, we can get const, you know, so, so we, can, we can come up with a matrix product state whose bond dimension across a particular bond of our choice is constant and bond dimension across every other bond is, is n, or polynomial in n. And so if you want to cut this bond, you can make sure that it has constant bond dimension. And then the epsilon net will have only polynomially many uh, elements. And so you have you know, polynomial time. Except now you have introduced constant error each time you fix one of these bonds. They're n bonds, so you can't afford this kind of error. So we've, we've got to somehow drive down the error. And the idea is we can now use the AGSP to drive down the error. So, so you know, the number of subproblems we have to search through is small, but then we can use the AGSP to drive down the error, and the, hopefully that'll, that'll work. You know, once you think through what it means to apply this AGSP to, well, of course, if you had, the, if you had a complete state, then you could apply the AGSP to it, and that there'd be no problem. It would, it, would, it would project it closer to the ground state, and so it would reduce the error. But now, remember, we don't have a, the complete state. We, we only have this left state. So how do we apply this operator to just the, the left half of the state? So, well, what you have to do is you have to take, this, take your operator and decompose it across this cut. So you write it as a sum of products. And, and so what, what you end up doing is writing it as, as, as a sum of uh, polynomially many terms of this form. And you have to apply each of these AJs to the left state. So, so what it does is it takes, you know, it takes the, the dimension of your subspace and it, and it increases it by a polynomial factor. Now, of course, we can't afford to have this polynomial increase at, at every step. But this is where this approximate decoupling comes in, right? Remember that um, for, for, every, you know, for every element of the boundary contraction, we only needed to keep the optimal state on the left. So, so what we do is, so, so we are now alternating between these two steps. You know, one which cuts down the number of elements, uh, the, the other which reduces the error but proliferates the number of elements, and so we just keep going back and forth between the two. Okay. Now this gets a little complicated because also in the, in the process what happens is the complexity of our, of, our, of our states goes up. So remember, what we are keeping track of is a, is a basis for this subspace. And we have got to describe the basis elements explicitly as matrix product states to say, well, we have a succinct description for each of the, each of the states in our, in our basis. So as, as we do this process, uh, the complexity of those elements goes up. You know, the bond dimension goes up. And so we have to cut that down as well. So, so basically what we're doing is, you know, each time we extend the number of particles by one, we do these three steps where we, where, where, um, Reduce the error, reduce the bond dimension, then we, then we use approximate decoupling to reduce the, the dimension, and then we just keep going on. Okay. And then, of course, by the, by the end of the process, we have this polynomial dimensional space for the, for the whole thing, which is, which is guaranteed to contain an approximation to the ground state. And then we can, we can solve the STP, and that's, that's the solution. OK, so, so um, let me just say a word about, about this algorithm. So, so as it stands, this, you know, uh, you know, one, one way you can think about this is it's, you know, to, just as an analogy, 
Um, you know, uh, we had this simplex algorithm for linear programming, which was fast in practice. We didn't, but, it, but in theory, we didn't know. And then there was this, uh, um, you know, the ellipsoid algorithm, which was, which was provably polynomial time, but nobody would ever dream of implementing it. So, you know, probably that's the way to think about this. This is, you know, it shows that it's polynomial time in, in theory, but, but this is not the way you want to implement it. But now you could ask, can we actually make this faster? And, and it seems like th there should be local versions of this algorithm, uh, at least using AGSPs, and this is what you know, we're, we're thinking about. And um, the other thing you could ask is, well, now that, now that we know how to prove things in 1D, can we actually do anything provable in 2D? You know, uh, and again, the, these, are, these are all interesting questions to think about. OK. so. Um, so let me come back to this, uh, to the to the second theme that I talked about of uh, of controlling a, an untrusted quantum device. So, um, so, um, um, so this is work with uh, Ben Reichardt and Falk Unger from you know, which was published earlier this year. Where where um, the picture we had in mind was uh, there's a there's a classical experimentalist who is confronted with with uh, untrusted quantum devices. And, and um, we are considering the extreme case where we, have, we trust nothing about these devices at all. They are black boxes with uh, binary inputs and outputs. They are entangled. And now we want, to, we, want to, we want to make sure that the initial state and the dynamics are exactly what, what we'd like. Um, um, so what's, what's the problem with doing this? Um, so, so Certainly, the, the Hilbert space of each device could be very large. But then, within that, we, how do we know what, the, you know what these devices are up to? So for example, when we, when, when we issue a command saying, measure this qubit, right? how do we know that the, the, the classical bit that's reported is even the result of measuring a qubit? Right? I mean, it could be. It could be a more general measurement on the on the system. It it may not be compatible with a qubit at all. So this is sort of the the most basic problem in in getting started on this. And so, um, okay. So the, the the way to deal with this is to appeal to um, you know the starting point is is this um, is Bell inequality or the CHSH game, uh, which which you can think of as a test for quantumness. Right, so in a in a very simple setting, it's 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 a place where an, a classical experimentalist can can at least test that that quantum devices have some quantumness to them. So, so what's the test? It's you know it, do, it doesn't really matter the details, but but um, uh, but each of the devices which we in in this game we call Alice and Bob uh, get as input a random bit uh, x or y, and then they output a bit a and b. And they're trying to satisfy some condition, which again, it's not so important, but they, they're trying to make sure that the, that the sum or two of their output bits is, is the same as the product of the input bits. And um, it's easy to see that classically, the best you can do is, um, is 75%, you know, be correct on 75% of the inputs, for example, by always outputting A equal to B equal to zero. So as long as X and Y are not both one, you get the right answer. If Alice and Bob share a bell pair, then they can achieve a, a success probability of uh, 0.85 uh, cosine squared pi by 8. OK, so, so now um, how do they do this? Well, there's, there's some strategy for doing this, which involves um, you know, depending upon x, whether it's 0 or 1, Alice measures her qubit in the bell pair in one of two bases. And, depending upon why Bob measures his qubit in one of two bases. So, so there's some optimal strategy which achieves cosine squared pi by it. OK, and you can do no better. So the, the first step in, in proving our theorem was, was proving this uh, rigidity theorem for, for CHSH games. So, so, so remember, Alice and Bob, their Hilbert space is not bounded, right? It, it could be anything. Um, so now, what the rigidity theorem says, suppose we actually play the game with Alice and Bob, and suppose that they win with probability close to cosine squared pi by 8. 
So cosine squared pi by 8 minus epsilon. Then the, the theorem says that they must share a Bell state, um, or close to a Bell state, actually. Uh, so their initial state must be, must be the following. It must be square root of epsilon close in trace, trace distance to a Bell state tensor product with everything else. So, so it doesn't matter what the rest of their state is. It's in tensor product with this Bell state, at least up to, up to whatever level of approximation. And then, uh, you know, and up to some unitary change of basis on each side, right? So you, you okay, so now once you, once you do that, then you can also say that, in fact, they must perform their measurements according to the CHSH strategy that I outlined before. So they must do exactly what the ideal strategy says. On this, uh, you know, once you change, you, you know, once you change the, the individual bases to make everything look right. Okay. So, so this gives you a measure of control just by, just by testing, you know, this, this fact. So now um, the next step involves actually showing that suppose we play a sequence of CHSH games. So we just do this sequentially over and over again. Then what we can say is that if, if the devices win with close to, again, cosine squared pi by eight, uh, they, they win close to that fraction of games. So in the previous case, I talked about the probability of winning, which we cannot really you know, how do we know what that probability is? But now we are just playing a sequence of games, and we just look at how many we win. So if we win close to 0.85 fraction of the games, then they must share, you know, then, then they must share n, you know, close to n Bell states in tensor product with the rest, and they must perform these ideal CHSH uh, measurements. Okay, so, um, le let me say it a little more precisely. You know, th this is sort of rough, a rough statement, but the, what the more precise statement says is, suppose you play you know, polynomial in n number of games, and then at some random point, you stop. And you say, okay, so you know, is, is the number of uh, games that are won close to cosine squared pi by eight? If yes, then, then, then you can say, now, the rest of the state that, that Alice and Bob share is close to, you know, is close to a tensor product of Bell states and whatever else. And then and the next n games that are played, they must play it in this way, according to the ideal CHSH strategy. Right? So you can you can set up a situation where you, where you are pretty pretty sure at the at the start of a certain point that they are going to be doing exactly what you say in this in this restricted space. So now, you know, once you, once you have, have them doing something that you want, you have them over a barrel, right? You can, you can now get them to do exactly what you want. So, so you can use tomography to leverage this multi-game rigidity theorem to force them to do exactly what you want, you know, by creating resource states and doing computation via teleportation and so on. OK. OK, so. Um, um, Okay, so you know, as I said before, there's you know there are various things you could you could use this for. So one of them was uh, device-independent quantum key distribution. So that follows easily once you have this kind of structure theorem. Um, you know, you you now don't have to trust the devices. You have Bell pairs. You can just measure them, and one, once you've established that that's true, but, but there's a problem. There's there's polynomial overhead and and it doesn't, you know, there's no error resilience. So you really have to work through this separately to, to do something. So um, in fact, um, you know, earlier this year, um, Tom Avedic and I showed we are different argument that, that in fact, you can modify Art, Arthur Eckert's protocol from, I think, back in 92 uh, to get one that's device independent, provably device independent. And this particular mo modified version actually achieves a, a, a bit rate which is within a factor of two of, of what's optimal, even without device independence. So it's really getting up there in terms of. Um, the, the other um, uh, task was testing that a claim quantum computer is really quantum. 
So, it, so actually, our results were inspired by these two papers of uh, Aronov, Benor, and Iban, and Broadbent, Fitzsimmons, and Kashefi, where they considered a slightly different setting where, where you have a classical verifier, but, but this classical verifier is given a little bit of a boost. So this class, classical verifier can also manipulate a small number of quantum bits and, uh, and shares a, uh, you know, this small narrow quantum channel with the, with the, with the prover. So now there's only a, a single prover or a single experiment. Uh, that, that. And then there's, of course, a classical channel, which is you know, where they can communicate as required. And so, you know, so these small number of qubits can be exchanged back and forth. You know, of course, of course the, um, the prover can build up, a, you know, a reservoir of qubits in the process. And, um, and they showed that, in fact, in this model, you can, you can verify any quantum computation at all. Okay. How is really quantum defined in this theorem? Yeah, so uh, here, the, the way it's defined is, um, let's say that uh, you have a quantum um, circuit in mind, and um, what you want is that this quantum computer should, should on input x, um, apply this quantum circuit to x and report the output. And, um, and in fact, the verifier can, can be satisfied if all the tests, uh, you know, um, if all the tests are passed, that, that, that in fact, um, that particular circuit got applied to X with very high probability and, and the output was really genuinely what would result. But isn't the trajectory probabilistic? Yeah, yeah, so, so you're sampling from the output distribution, okay. from, you know, very close to the, the correct distribution. Yeah. Um, okay, so, um, So, you know, one, one could be even more ambitious than this, and one, one might say, well, what we'd really like to do is, you know, we'd, we'd like to come up with, with, a, with a general way of testing quantum mechanics. So, um, so you know, you could take this viewpoint that, um, you know, that this, this exponential growth in the, you know, in complexity, this is, you know, this is probably the most Counterintuitive aspect of quantum mechanics, and then you you know you, you take the view that um, um, one thing that physicists like to do is test their theories in you know in the limit of its applicability, like um, you know high energy or very small sizes or close to the speed of light. And each time you test in these limits, you discover something new. So, what about you know? Is it shouldn't we be testing physics in this limit of high complexity. And then you run into sort of what seems to be a basic problem, which is, well, if you, if you want to test in, these, in, this high, in this limit of high complexity, then how do you even, you know, how do you even know what your experiment will, will do? You know, you want to, so to set up the experiment, you want to first calculate what the result should be, and, and that, that would in general be a problem. So, so what you, you know, so, so a general way to deal with this is you, you would want to come up with some sort of an interactive experiment instead of the usual style of experiment where, where um, you know, where you think of the classical verifier as, as carrying out an interactive proof with the, with the apparatus. And uh, what we want to know is, um, is, is it possible that, you know, in the spirit of interactive proofs that, that that a quantum polynomial time, time um, uh, prover can convince a classical polynomial time verifier of any, you know, of, of any language in, in BQP. And purely classical, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what we'd like eventually, right? So, so now of course, you know, what, what we know is that uh, Interactive proofs are as powerful as p-space, and p-space contains quantum polynomial time. So it would seem that the answer is trivially yes, but, but of course, in order to get IP equal to p-space, the prover has to be as powerful as p-space. And here, we only have a prover who can do <coughs> quantum polynomial time computation. And, 
And so that's, that's, really, that's really an open question. Um, that's, OK, so in a sense, we don't, we don't even need for this to be a single prover. It could be two provers. You, know, you could set up two experiments that don't communicate with each other. So you could ask, well, why doesn't the result that I just showed, why isn't that sufficient to, 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 to solve this problem? Well, the point is that in, in, order to, in order to prove correctness of that result, we had to make use of properties of quantum mechanics. So, you know, so maybe it gives you a weak version of this, but, but to really claim this, what you, what you need to do is, you know, there are two sides of this. You, want, you need to say, well, if, you know, so, so in, in interactive proofs, you have this two-sided thing, right? If, if X is in the language, then, then there's something that the prover can say which convinces the verifier. And then there's a flip side to it, which says, if X is not in the language, then no matter what the prover does, it won't convince the verifier except with very low probability. Right? So that has to be unconditional. That second part has to be unconditional. And for us, that second part depends upon, well, it depended upon CHSH and so on. Right? So, so, so at least that part of quantum mechanics has, we, we have to rely on for the, for the no answer. And getting that no answer unconditionally, I think, is a very interesting question. I'm sorry? If you're willing to, if you allow them to exchange a few qubits. Yeah, how, even how then it's, it I'm sorry? How helpful it is. Uh, we don't know. So, so even there, you know, making it unconditional, unconditional based on, so, so I think these are, um, um, so, so certainly there's a, there's a big technical problem here, you know, in terms of, well, what's the one prover system BQP bounded are uh, capable of, but then, but then, you know, once you, once you try to say, well, how about, how about a small amount of quantumness and so on? And then there, there, there's a real question about how do you formulate the problem? And, you know, and that, that becomes quite, quite difficult. Um, I should finish up in a couple of minutes. So, so let, me, let me just wrap up quickly. The, the last slide, and then I'll, I'll just say a couple. Um, maybe I'll, oh, OK. So, uh, so there's this. Um, you know, there's this very fundamental um, test in, in classical complexity theory called the classical multilinearity test, which is, um, which is sort of a, a major component of, uh, of the PCP theorem. Um, and what it is is, you know, you, you're, you're told you're, you're given access to a linear, a multilinear function, let's say, and uh, a linear function on many variables. But... Um, but you don't trust that it's actually a linear function. So how do you, can you, can you sort of quickly, with very few probes, tell that the function that you're actually probing is very close to a multilinear function? So this is a very, very fundamental uh, building block in the, in the PCP theorem. So it goes back to Blum, Loopy, Rubenfeld. Now, this quantum multigame rigidity uh, theorem, this gives you a similar, you know, a similar object in the, on the quantum side. Because, because what it allows you to do is, through these very simple tests, which are these CHSH tests, it allows you to, to verify that there's an object which belongs to a certain class, which is you know, like the multilinear functions. Here, it says up to some unitary base change of bases, you, you know, the state is, a, is a close to a tensor product of Bell states with whatever else. And then you also get this, this uh, uh, condition that, that um, you know, the measurements must be according to exactly these, these conditions. So it's, it's sort of an analog of, of, uh, of this multilinearity test. And so it's sort of interesting to see how much further one can push these sorts of uh, ideas. I should say that um, there, was a, there was a beautiful reason, recent result by uh, um, Tsuyoshi Ito and Toma Vidik uh, showing that this classical multilinearity test also extends if you have quantum provers. So here, the object that they share, you know, if you do this, this particular test, you can show that, in fact, they don't share a quantum object. The quantum object must essentially be this classical multilinearity test. OK, so, um, uh, so le let me just finish up by saying uh, some of the things that I talked about today, you know, these, these, this general topic, uh, 
um, we are organizing, uh, I guess Matt and Dorit and, and Frank and I are organizing this program at the Simons Institute in Berkeley in spring, um, in, in, in this coming spring, um, you know, with, uh, with this focus on quantum games and protocols and area laws and ha Hamiltonians and tensor network simulations, et cetera. So, um, you know, if you're interested, uh, please let us know and come and visit us. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a long list of people who are already committed to coming, so it, would be, it should be a nice party and you should come join us. And um, uh, hopefully by the time you arrive, the, you know, our building will be habitable. And so, uh, okay, thank you. <laughs>